I'm Ian. For those of you I haven't met yet, I hope to meet you today sometime. Welcome. Welcome to the University Church. This is a very strange and special place, as you've already figured out. Probably at home they didn't have you singing in Hindi uh, or doing all these things. We are a deliberately global church. And so as you represent the globe here at Yale, so we try to represent the global Christian community in our songs and our prayers. So if you have songs or prayers from home you'd like us to sing or include, we'd be happy to do that. But we want to represent all the places and traditions you come from, so let us know. This church, not the building, but the church itself, is one of the successors of the original Yale church, which was founded by and for Yale students in 1757 purportedly because the preaching of the pastor at Center Church was not strong enough for the spirited young men of Yale. In fact, Thomas Clapp, the president right up here in the window, said he described the preaching as thin gruel. I hope to do better. Welcome to this chapel building, Battelle, which has also been a place of solace and inspiration to generations of Yale students since 1767. It is a strange building. It is a bread box built into a quadrangle uh, with all this wild decoration, not a congregational church at all. Uh, but here we are. This was what they decided in 1867, and we love it. Uh, it has become home to many of us, as quirky as it is, and it is a beautiful place in the midst of an urban campus. You are welcome here anytime, any place. Candace and I are happy to meet you for coffee, to talk, to get to know you. We would love to. This awe-inspiring building, and hot building, there was no AC in 1867, may feel a little intimidating to you. But in coming here, you enter a long line of Yale students whose faith has been supported and challenged and grown through their years in this very building. It may feel very different from your home church, but we hope that in a few weeks it will become home for you. But I've been thinking about those young white men who were sitting here back in 1867 for daily prayers. And I realize there is one difference between them and you. Many differences, but the one I was thinking of is that they were required to be here and often grumbled about that requirement if you read the histories. So we are grateful that you're here without coercion. People come to church on their first Sunday of college for many different reasons. Because mom and dad told you to, perhaps. Because in some cases, mom and dad actually got you up this morning and brought you here. Because you live in Farnham and the organ practice woke you up, so you decided to come to church because you've gone to church every Sunday of your life, because you've never been to church and you wanted to see what it was about. Perhaps for many of you, it's simply because it was in the opening day schedule and you've done every event listed in the opening day schedule, including the Portuguese placement exam and tryouts for the Quidditch team. Perhaps you're here because you loved your home church or youth group and are seeking to recreate that experience here. But I want to suggest another reason that you're here today that you might not have considered, that God brought you here. It may sound like a quaint notion, that there is a supernatural force capable of sustaining the universe that could at the same time be concerned about what you, one Yale freshman, is doing on Sunday morning, August 26, 2012. Scholars may scoff at the possibility as they scoff at the idea of free will itself, they would say, you didn't choose to come here and God didn't bring you either. Your being here is merely the result of accident, genetics, history, and evolutionary impulse. Somehow an uncountable number of mostly random events convinced your genes that there was a reproductive advantage to your coming to church this morning. Who knew? I wonder what Timothy Dwight or Jonathan Edwards would say about that. But I want to suggest that God brought you here not because I'm the kind of person who believes that if I find a quarter on the sidewalk that God put it specifically there for me. I want to suggest that God brought you here because God cares about your decisions. And not only that, God is actually part of those decisions. 
you may feel like you're here on your own. You may feel like whether you're religious or not is entirely your decision. But I want to suggest that God is intimately involved in your life and you in God's. It's actually a rather daunting possibility because it implies that you are here at Yale not merely because you are incredibly intelligent, talented, motivated, hardworking, though I know you are. If God cares, then it is possible that you are here because a force greater than your own accomplishments wanted you to be here. <gasps> Could anything be bigger than my own accomplishments? Oh my gosh, Ian, you are breaking up Yale. What is the undergraduate admissions office going to say? That's what Yale's all about. It's all about my accomplishments and more accomplishments. Ten times more, a hundred times more. Sign me up for everything. This idea that God cares is daunting because it might imply that you are here not entirely because of your plans, even. And Yale people are planful people. But because your plans aligned with a much greater plan. And even more daunting, that if your personal plan might diverge from that greater plan at some point, the greater plan might prevail. Oh dear, I know you've been on a path since you were in second grade. You've been on the treadmill. One more step, one more addition to the resume. Ah, gonna get there, hard work, hard work, all the way. What if God gets in the way? Oh. Would you be mad? What if God said suddenly, I want you to step off the treadmill for a moment and explore life with me? Ah, no, wouldn't happen. In our gospel passage today, the fifth and final passage from the sixth chapter of John that we've been reading over the last five Sundays, we've had plenty of John 6, Jesus summarizes a meditation in which he describes himself as the bread of heaven sent from God to feed the spiritually hungry and to satisfy that hunger eternally. Jesus as bread. Choosing language that was almost certainly intended to offend his own Jewish hearers, Jesus says, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me. Oof, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Jesus was not advising cannibalism, don't worry. Probably wasn't talking directly about the Eucharist either. He was saying that simply believing is not enough. Those who want to follow him and through him be reconciled to God need to get close, intimately, humanly, fleshily close. You need to be able to smell God. And these words did offend. His, fo his own followers say, this teaching is too difficult. Who can accept it? This was not the God they thought they knew. Their God was unknowably holy up in heaven, mighty and just, transcending all the world and all flesh. And humanity was way down here, utterly finite, passing and sinful. And the two could never meet. God could never be bound up in human flesh. The very idea that God could come down from heaven was offensive and blasphemous. Father John Shea, one of my favorite spiritual writers, says, the way we ordinary religious people think is such that we believe that God is completely other and people are completely earthbound. People are from earth and have glimmers occasionally of a higher world, but they never belong to it. People are physical beings with spiritual intuitions, but can never be spiritual beings seeking ever greater incarnations. Jesus reverses the direction of religion. It is not we who through our decisions decide what we will believe and then aspire to God. Rather, it is God who in Jesus reaches into the world and brings divinity to fleshly human life. And people can, by taking Jesus in, by discovering his consciousness, become not just animals seeking the sky, but children of God, incarnated and fleshed in the mess of this world. It is too much for many of Jesus' disciples to hear. They pack up their bags and they leave. I think this is good evidence for the historicity of, Christi of the Bible. What other scripture would include the fact that most of the people got up and left in the middle of the story? They don't want to believe that God could get involved in human life in such a messy, real, intimate way. God's over here in God's box. 
and all the rest of life is over here. Jesus seems to want to say just the opposite. We are in a little box, and God and divinity is surrounding us. If only we'll open up. Jesus asked the few who will remain, is this teaching too hard for you, too? Do you want to go? And Peter responds, where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We all imagine, I'm sure, that if we were there, we would be among the faithful few, like Peter, and not the disgusted majority. After all, you're here on Sunday morning, and your sweet mates are sleeping. You're on the good side. But are we really ready to hear Jesus' difficult teaching? Are we really ready to eat his flesh and drink his blood to make him part of us? Not at communion, which for many of us is so easily done, but in our daily lives. Are we ready to admit that we are not entirely in charge of our lives and our future, but that we participate in God so literally that we're directed not by our talents and our desires and our plans, but by a deeper purpose, a more complex meaning, a fuller justice and holiness than we can manufacture ourselves. There is something good. There is something bigger than me. Father Shea again talks about teaching a class at the seminary where he teaches in which he requires his students to read a really advanced spiritual text and they struggle and they complain and they find it confusing and even offensive. But over time they keep at it paragraph by paragraph until spiritual insights they'd never imagined come through. He says, he tells them, and I think this is the one message I want you to take away today. Never waste your time reading a book you could have written. In our walk with Christ, too often we presume that because we were raised in the church or had a conversion or read through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, that we know Christianity pretty well and we could write the book ourselves. But even for me and people in this church who are much wiser and more spiritual than me, there is still so much to explore and understand. We're not done. The temptation in our religious culture is to say that if it's difficult, just skip it. It's not worth it. The Trinity, ugh, too hard. Morality, justice, evil, ugh, too hard. Christianity should be easy. It should be comforting and generically good and moral and positive. Imagine what would happen if you had this attitude about organic chemistry. Is Jesus worth as much effort? Basically today, for many, Christianity is a nice hobby. But the Jesus who speaks through John's gospel today will not be happy being a lifestyle or a style, a subculture or a club. The Jesus who speaks in John wants to get into our lives and mess with them. And we have to be ready for that. The Jesus who speaks in John challenges us to trust him enough to listen to these hard teachings until we can struggle our way to understanding. We do not choose this Jesus. This Jesus chooses us. Often those who do not yet believe presume that Christians are people who one day in deep thought decided to believe, rightly or wrongly. But those of us inside the church know that faith is really not an intellectual or a lifestyle choice. It is rather that we, like St. Peter, have to say, where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Christian faith is an awkward compulsion fueled only by the deep hunger we feel to be as close to God as God's own flesh and blood. We do not choose it in all its messiness, but we do realize that no other path works for us. Last spring, Lauren Burke, one of our student deacons who graduated, gave a courageous sermon here that I've quoted many times. She said that she lived in fear through her Yale experience. Fear that every choice she made, a class, a major, an internship, might be the wrong one. The one that took her off the remarkable path of success in her life, away from the plan God had for her. She said that she finally overcame this fear by developing a deeper spiritual understanding that she hadn't had before. That God was not pointing her down a single path. That if she strayed off it, she would somehow lose or lose God. But she said she realized that whatever choice she made, even no choice, God would be there. 
The life of faith is not the treadmill of success. It is a halting journey, more like a crazy video game than the flight of an arrow. It promises new, amazing revelations at every turn. It promises a wisdom that overcomes the turbulence of our feelings and our fears. It promises an intimacy with God that fills us and embraces us. It promises mistakes and forgiveness, resilience when we stumble, sustenance when we are hungry and thirsty for a deeper purpose than just our own plan. This church, I have to tell you now, is not perfect. We will make promises to you that we won't always keep. We will sometimes say one thing and do something else. We will sometimes pretend to know, this especially applies to me, when we don't. But we do promise to be with you every step of the way. We promise to tell you the truth, even if it hurts. We promise not to tell you the right answer before you've had a chance to speak. We promise to listen to you and to love you. We promise to continually challenge you to live out your faith by serving the suffering around us in New Haven, but also at Yale. We promise to do our best to do a few simple things, to love God, to love each other, and to do something about it. We promise to look at you as an individual with a story and a set of dreams and unlimited possibilities. And we promise that though we may sometimes falter, to look at you and see the glory 